Welcome, everybody, uh, to our webinar on how to secure your software supply chain on Windows Server. Uh, my name is Kevin Ng, and I will be your host and presenter for today. But a little bit more about myself. Um, my name is Kevin Ng. I am a senior solutions architect at Mirantis with over a decade of experience in optimizing enterprise level software delivery processes. So previously, I was a, a professional services a consultant and now working in pre sales. And I really specialize in identifying and resolving critical issues in areas such as requirements management, development, uh, continuous integration, testing, and delivery, both on-prem and in the cloud. So that reduces your time between your business idea to value and also improving your business outcomes to you know, clients such as yourself. In today's webinar, we will talk about the following. Now, as you could see from the de description in the, um, in the talk, Enterprises depend on a secure software development pipeline from the first stage of development all the way to production. And at the same time, when you factor in Windows containers, there are some unique challenges that presents itself. So that's what we're going to talk about today. So in today's webinar, we'll currently cover the following topics. First, we'll define the software supply chain, what that means, um, the extent of the coverage, and so on. Uh, we will then explore the role of the container runtime within the software supply chain. And as Windows Server users, what does that really mean for the business? And finally, we'll look at how the Mirantis container runtime can support the foundation of a secure software supply chain. Our topic for today really is about the software supply chain and what is the supply chain? What extent does it cover? And we know traditionally, <clears throat> The concept of supply chain comes from your manufacturing logistic businesses, where it is the activity of your vendors, your producers of goods, to transportation to your endpoints, distribution centers, and then all the way to retailers. Now, when you take that into software, there are, of course, parallels that we could uh, apply onto them. Right? So when we bring in the supply chain concept into software, we still have our vendors, our producers are kind of now our development uh, organization, right? The developers are actually developing the code, uh, developing the the, um, the the baseline uh, images that you'll be working with. Um, your transportation is almost like a deployment pipeline, right? How does the code get from your developers all the way to production, all the individual steps in between there? Your distribution centers, kind of like your data centers, this is where everything is held at. Your program, your actual application is held there. Um, your servers, and then that goes into your end clients, right? Your retailers is kind of a, uh, a, a mixture between both your servers and your end client machines. And of course, what we want to make sure is we're not just looking at one or the other, because a lot of the times when we talk about the conversation, it's really focused around, you know, your, your development and deployment, right? Or your data centers and servers. And a lot of people overlook the fact that the software supply chain starts well before you start developing. So these are things that we want to take into consideration when we're talking about how to secure a software supply chain. <clears throat> right? So if we look at this in a little bit more detail on what a typical development process or deployment process look like. Now, I know this is a little bit of a, um, <laughs> a, a, a a crowded graph over here, but I'll, I'll do my best to kind of point out the various um, cycles and steps in there, right? So think of a, a typical development process, especially in the containerized world now. Traditionally, your developers will create code that perhaps have some libraries that are frameworks that you start with or play code. Um, but within the containerized environment, one of the benefits of containerization is that there are other containers out there that you can use that are created by other people so you don't have to reinvent the wheel right so typically what people would do is pull images perhaps directly from docker hub um, and then start building on top of that or uh, some of the more mature companies will perhaps have their own private registry where the images are pulled in and then stored and then developers pull that uh, to build off of in their code <clears throat> right when your code is built that gets checked into source code management your continuous integration process kicks off to build the images store that into your local registry and then your release automation process why to take that deploy it onto the end servers 
or using an orchestration like Kubernetes engine uh, or Docker Swarm, push them out into your data centers, whether on-prem or in the cloud. And that's where the actual containers run, right? And this is where the container runtime um, exists. So as you can see over here, your environment could be a mixture of Windows, it could be Linux, it could be hybrid or primarily one or the other. Um, so that's where the development process will look like. And then when you look at it from the other side, we have our operations folks making sure that our environment is actually there for our developers to deploy into, for our release managers to deploy into, right? So using a um, as a service uh, infrastructure as code management plane, you can then deploy either Kubernetes clusters or runtimes onto your environment so that your code can be deployed onto it. And then since we're talking about true DevSecOps, we want to make sure that we have monitoring and alerting and also logging so that you get the observability of what your code is doing in production as well. So you have your observation, observability, your logging, monitoring, alerting, which then reports back to both operations and in true DevOps fashion reports into your uh, developers as well. So your developers or SREs can see what their code is doing once it's being pushed into production into the various environments so that remediation can start right away, right? So with this picture in mind, <clears throat> we're gonna really focus in on this section over here, right? Our servers and how the container environments run on that server. Okay, so what is the role of a container runtime? And let's go take a step back and talk about containerization as opposed to are more traditional virtualization of applications and how they run, right? And this is perhaps not a, an unfamiliar site to a number of you, especially if you've already done containerization or have dabbled a little bit with it. But if you think about how containerization and virtualization works um, traditionally versus um, in, in the container world, when you have virtual machines, essentially what we get is blocks of actual virtual machines to have your independent OSs running on top of hypervisor. Each virtual machine is relatively isolated to each other. Perhaps you'll have networking that connects them together, but they're relatively isolated, right? If, you, if, if one of the machines are breached, unless they go to the network somehow, it's really hard, it's a bit harder to breach into some of the other machines because they're rather isolated. Uh, when you start looking at the container, world, on the other hand, when we do have the added benefit of the containers being a lot more lightweight because you don't have a full operating system underneath your code and your runtimes, um, and then all that runs on a single container engine, which is directly running within your operating system. So this is where you could see perhaps some vulnerabilities may arise, right? So if Hypothetically speaking, one of your containers are breached. You go into the container engine. The container engine is directly connected to your operating system, which is connected to your infrastructure, which potentially is connected to other uh, systems within your infrastructure. So within one container, if all of these layers are breached, there's a problem, right? And you know, there is usually pretty good security mechanism was within the operating system itself, right? So for Linux environments, we know we do set comps, we do app armor to make sure that processes that are unauthorized to run cannot be run um, depending on policy. Now, when we come into Windows, that becomes a little bit trickier because now Windows, we know, does have security built in, right? So with Windows, we have our Windows Defender app control policy. We have our, our app, um, and I can't remember the actual word, I believe it, it's the app, um, is it App Defender, I think it is, right? That allows you to control who or what can run particular applications or scripts. Uh, that is good, right? Because that allows you to block off certain applications on an application level. But what it kind of lacks a little bit versus something like setcoms on, on the Linux side of things is that it becomes less granular. There is more security that needs to be implemented 
on layers above that, right? Because you may say, okay, I don't want folks to run this script. I don't want folks to run this application. However, it does nothing to stop really people from doing other activities within your operating system. So that's one of the unique challenges that essentially comes up when you're talking about Windows environments. There's the, it's not as granular in terms of system calls that you're able to restrict unauthorized users from performing once you're talking about Windows, which means then a lot more security needs to be implemented on the layer above that. So if I go a slide before that, we need to implement more security on the container engine side of things so that what you're doing over here is doesn't breach through to the operating system, right? Or you, essentially what we also wanna do is, obviously it's gonna be best if there's no breaches in the first place, right? If we don't give any malicious actors any methods of obtaining things that can actually breach into our environment. So that's where the container security, the container runtime security really becomes paramount when we're talking about the Windows environment. Now, when you look at the Windows container runtime options, and these this is on the, um, the Microsoft website as well and on Microsoft Learns on the different options you have when you wanna run containers on Windows. So there are one of three different things you could do, right? We have the Mirantis container runtime, which is of course our enterprise grade container runtime that has full hardening security components already built in. We'll talk about that in the following slides. You also have container D, which is your open source uh, standard for running OCI compliant containers. That is the basis of a lot of container runtimes out there. And then you have Docker Community Edition, Docker CE, which perhaps most of you are familiar with. And that is built into part of the Mobi project, which is an open source framework that allows you to build your container runtime, which is essentially what would base off uh, our, our Mirantis container runtime off of. It is um, part of the, well, the Mobi project is included in the Mirantis container runtime. I'm trying to find a better way of saying that. But, so essentially what happens is within Mirantis, a lot of our developers are actually maintainers and developers within the Mobi project. So um, anything that goes into the open source environment, any pull requests, any bug reports uh, in both the Mobi project and also within Mirantis container runtime, we look at those. Um, if it's built within the Mobi project, we then bring that into our container runtime and then ensure that our enterprise, enterprise uh, level testing and hardening is applied to that. And at the same time, if we find anything within the Mirantis container runtime um, environment and at the, the community, if any customers bring anything uh, to our attention, we fix that, that flows into the open source community as well, right? So we were, we're trying, we'd like to maintain the, the health um, and that interaction between the open source environment. And that's kind of the core uh, of our values as well here at Mirantis. So within the three of these, of course, two of these are open source and readily available to you. Uh, what it does, however, lack is some of the more rigorous testing that you perhaps will get from a, 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 a testing organization uh, that we have within Mirantis because you know the community is great. They, everybody will test their own use cases and that actually gets us um, a lot of improvements. Um, but we want to make sure that uh, security is paramount, and that's what we do rigorous testing on. Uh, we also do build um, the container runtime within our container runtime using uh, enterprise grade level and actually federal grade level encryption uh, to ensure that all of our code is secure out of the box. Right. So with these, um, with the Brantis container runtime, then you'll get that peace of mind of you know what, we make sure that everything here is going to be run on FIPS 140-2 validated encryption algorithm. Okay, so what you get within the Mirantis container runtime to ensure that uh, nothing flows through to your operating system is we have container D and run C built in. We have the Docker build build kit um, built in to the Kubernetes container runtime. So these are things that are out of the box that you don't have to implement on top of uh, either Mobi or Container D to ensure that it runs with everything else. Uh, we also have CRI Docker D built into 
our container runtime so that this can act as a Kubernetes node for any CNCF certified Kubernetes. And we also have um, compatibility on both Windows and Linux with any choice of your infrastructure. So we have built-in security and it's based on open standards. There's stability and predictability because we test on every uh, operating system that is commonly used out there in the enterprise. But, you know, good, yet you may think, okay, yeah, here's a product page, but how does that contribute to security? So let's talk about the different things that you will need uh, when you're talking about a secure container runtime. And let's start, first of all, with the encryption of the environment, of uh, our FIPS 140-2 foundation. Okay, and let's talk about the FIPS standards a little bit. So what is, what does FIPS do for us? What does encryption do for us? And before I go into the details of FIPS, I wanted to talk a little bit about one of the findings from the 2023 cost of data breach report done by IBM. So this is the latest one that just came out. Uh, organizations with an extensive use of encryption sees a cost reduction of $221,000 out of their breaches versus those that do not. Right, this is a very abbreviated thing of the entire report. I, I um, recommend everybody checking out that report because it does provide a really uh, clean, clear picture of what's actually, you know, what are the security risks out there and what are the actual tangible uh, implementation or, or, or tangible results of you know, what happens if things are not secure, right? So with a, an extensive encryption, you A, get a cost reduction of anything that may happen and if you're implementing zero trust, this is also one of the core tenets of the zero trust principle and that all communication is secured. And not just by any encryption algorithm, right? Because there are many ways of encrypting your data, but you want a validated cryptographic module used for encryption. So this is where FIPS 140-2 comes into play. And FIPS is um, a federal information processing standard so it's one of the standards used by the federal government. And this is created by uh, NIST, which is the National Institutes of Standards and Technology. And these are the folks that provide us with papers such as what is zero trust architecture, uh, what is cloud security, all that kind of good stuff. And this breaks up the, the level of your information process standard into four different levels. From level one, where your components are encrypted uh, all the way to level four, when you have a completed hardening system, you have your um, communication encrypted, you have your hardware being secured, you have tamper-proof um, mechanisms in both the software and the hardware. So these are all things that are specified within uh, the FIPS standard. Now, if you're interested in finding more about uh, FIPS in detail, we will actually cover FIPS in much more detail in an upcoming webinar in November titled FIPS 140-2 Validated Encryption for Windows Containers. So if you'd like a deeper dive into the topic, please do register uh, for the webinar and we will do a much deeper dive into what FIPS means and also what FIPS means uh, in Windows Containers. So we're essentially here, right, on level one. So level one requires production grade equipment and one tested encryption algorithm. And this must be a working encryption algorithm, not one that has not been authorized for use. So what does that really mean for yourself if you're using a container runtime that has FIPS 140-2 validation? Well, one, that means that if you are um, aiming for your own FIPS validation as well, the environment that you're deploying to and the, the, the development that you're working on is already FIPS validated part of your components. So you don't have to do the full thing afterwards. So you, all you have to do is focus on your application on top of the runtime and making sure that is validated. Um, and we got the basis covered for you. What that also means is if you're not aiming for your FIPS um, validation on your own product, it means that whatever platform that you're running on, the container runtime that you're running on, is essentially secure enough to run in federal agencies, which means, or and major financial institutions. 
So there is a peace of mind that whatever you're running on is going to be secure enough to make sure that you don't um, run into any breach or any no one can breach into your environment because we're blocking the path um, right before your operating system. So some of the folks that have been using our container runtime really lives in you know, finance space, the telco space, healthcare, logistics, actually every walk of life. So um, any industry that essentially needs encryption to protect the sensitive data uh, would benefit from this encryption. And it doesn't really stop there as well, right? So for those of you that are only running containers, we've got that covered. Uh, for those of you that are thinking about orchestrating your workloads onto uh, multiple uh, environments, multiple nodes, being a mixture of Windows and Linux, uh, we are also FIPS validated on our orchestrator as well, right? So the Marantis Kubernetes engine, which runs both CNCF certified Kubernetes, or if you're using a Swarm orchestration, both of these are included within the Marantis container and, and uh, Marantis Kubernetes engine and is FIPS validated. Okay. At the same time, there's also for edge locations, uh, we do have also the K0s uh, orchestration, which is a lightweight Kubernetes that will run on uh, edge devices, but a much more resource uh, constraint. Okay, So that is um, some of the things that we could uh, support as well. Right. So, you know, we've got the we've got the container runtime uh, there and it's secure. Right. So once you have that secured, then you know, whatever is going into your workloads would, you won't be able to, you, you won't expose, um, the word I'm looking for, you You won't expose any sensitive data, right? Any communication, any credentials that'll allow malicious actors to get in and go into your operating system, right? Because within the windows, you can't really block Docker from running because you actually do need to run, right? So once it comes through, then there's a problem. Now, once you have your container uh, secure, the next thing you want to make sure is that you now we've got the platform, but how about the workload on top of that, right? And this is one of the things that you will see when you're working with containers, right? One of the benefits of containerization is that there are literally thousands of images out there that folks have already built uh, for us to reuse. And reusability is a major time saver and advantage of containerization because then you can focus on your own workloads and perhaps Python, if you're needing a Python application or if you need to do something like an Azure Pipelines agent to run your DevOps pipelines, that's all available out there. However, if you have a look at this, this and this is a, a search that I just did on Docker Hub yesterday, right? If I search for Windows images, uh, that is just anyone out there, we have 3,000 of those, great. But when you start looking at the trusted content and I start putting some criteria onto, you know what, this must be an either an official image or a verified publisher where there's more security and you know exactly where it's coming from, we now go from 3,000 down to nine, right? So, and the nine I actually had looked through, some of these are, you know, you have your Golang and your OBS, but then there are other things that you may need that are not available to you. And that's where the risk will come in as well. Because, you know, as much as we like to trust folks out there, there are unfortunately malicious actors that are putting uh, malicious images onto Docker Hub that they're just waiting for folks to download and execute so that we could actually breach into the systems, right? And we've, we've all heard those horror stories where, where someone's downloaded an image, it's all great, but then there's a crypto miner in it, all right? And that's, Kind of your best case scenario where it's only reusing up resources. Your cost, you're 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 getting a cost hit because it is using up compute, right? So if you're on a public cloud, obviously you get your compute costs. But that's the extent of the breach. Um, there are worse scenarios where you have either ransomware or even worse when folks can just go through the images that they put online and then go into your system and then break into other areas within your environment. And that's what we want to avoid. So one of the things you have to make sure is within your supply chain, within your software supply chain, you don't start your software supply chain at the development phase. You actually want to start a step before at the vendor and the, the source phase, right? Where are you getting your images from? 
is that secure? And if it's not secure, how do we make sure it's secure? Okay. So once we pull your images, and let's let's be practical over here, you're not going to be able to use just nine of these images, right? So we do have to use one of these 3,000 images out there uh, to start our work, and that's fine. So what you want to do is after you pick one of those images, you want to make sure it is secure, and that is the next step of security within your software supply chain in your Windows environment or your Linux environment, which is scanning the software, uh, the container images for any vulnerabilities, right? So within um, a secure registry, such as the Maranta Secure Registry or your own secure registry, you want to implement secure scanning that actually goes through and identifies CVEs, common vulnerability and exposures, to determine if there's anything in the image components used. Now, once you've done that, you can also look at what the actual vulnerability is to determine if that applies to your environment and also if there's a fix available, right? So if we actually click on any one of these, you go to the actual CVE database within NIST to see any remediations as well on how you can then further harden your system or get rid of whatever this vulnerability is. And sometimes it's as easy as updating one of the layers in your images, right? So that's one thing. You, you make sure that your images are safe from any vulnerabilities that are, that are out there. But the second benefit that you'll get from your image scanning as well is that with the list of your vulnerabilities and any, any of the fixes uh, applied, you can also demonstrate compliance to regulations such as, depending on the, uh, the industry that you're working with, something like HIPAA for healthcare industries uh, for the US, uh, GDPR, if you work at any capacity within the European Union, or for Canadians, the PIPDA, our personal information um, uh, compliance, by providing proof that any vulnerable images have been blocked, high risk components are replaced and rebuilt, et cetera, which then proves that only authorized applications have access to sensitive data. All, right? All of these scans, of course, are logged and auditable so that you can provide this to your auditors to prove compliance to any of the regulations that are available. Right? So once you scan that and you ensure that your base images are all secure, the next thing you want to ensure within your container environment is to make sure that you are only running those authorized images. Right? So what we've done so far is we've made sure that the container runtime is secure through FIPS 140-2 validated encryption. You've ensured that whatever image you're running on top of that runtime is secure through your image scanning and your remediation, right? making sure there's no vulnerabilities. The next thing we need to do, though, is to make sure that the only thing that can run on your environment are those that are secure and authorized. And this is where the image signing and signature verification process comes in. And this is the built-in functionality of Amaranthus Container Runtime on Windows as well, which is a signature verification process. So what happens is your developers will build your image run on Amaranthus Container Runtime. You will then push that image and then sign it so that only authorized parties within your organization, um, perhaps the security department, uh, perhaps it's a security officer, or perhaps it's one of your um, senior developers, that um, essentially proves and certifies the authenticity and security of that image that you will be running. And then that would then infer, enforce that only signed images and authorized images can be pulled and executed on the Marathas container runtime. And we do that through the use of Notary, and that is you know, out of the box from uh, within the Marathas container runtime as well. Right? So anything that is signed, there's really no way of invalidating it, uh, aside from revoking your entire signing key. So because it's built in, the only way you could overwrite that signed image to make sure that you know someone, if someone else is trying to impersonate you, is to have your signing key and overwrite that signing process. Right? And so that then ensures that only authorized workloads can run on your platform. So now we've ensured that platform is secure through the container runtime. You've ensured your workload is secure through 
uh, the, the scanning of the images. Um, you perhaps also want to do some code scanning as well in the development process, but that's a typical um, development lifecycle process. Um, you know, your static code scanning, all that kind of good stuff. Uh, and then you ensure that only authorized workloads are executed on your runtime. And it's really easy to turn on within your environment as well, right? So once you turn signing on, you'll notice that if you try to deploy any workloads, you'll get the image does not meet the required signing policy because the thing that you're trying to deploy is not signed by authorized parties within your organization. And if you run it within an uh, orchestration like uh, Kubernetes and runs Kubernetes engine, you will get something similar to this, right? When you try to deploy a pod with a container that is not authorized to run, you will get a forbidden message so that whoever is trying to impersonate yourself and trying to inject a malicious code into your environment gets blocked through the image signing and verification process. And turning it on is easy. Turning it on is extremely easy. So within Windows, all you need to do is set the system variable when you have Marinus container runtime running. You just set the Docker content trust flag into one, and that's it. That's all you need to do to make sure that anything that is unauthorized will not be able to execute within your environment. Now, if you're using a Kubernetes uh, instance, it's again, just the flag that you turn on, you run only signed images, and now your environment is locked down and only things that are authorized to execute within your environment can be executed on the Marantis container runtime on Windows. All right, so it's a simple matter of saying yes, enter, and you're done. So to recap, when we talk about the secure software supply chain, right? One thing that I like you to, again to remember and to focus on is that your software supply chain actually starts well before the code even enters in your environment and development starts. The software supply chain actually starts from the source of where you're getting your base images and your code coming from. So when you want to secure it, you want to make sure that all levels in the steps are being secure. And once you have that, because of the unique challenges of, uh, presented by Windows and the, um, the lack of granularity of what you're able to turn off in terms of system calls within Windows, you want to make sure that you have a secure runtime on top of your operating system to, pr to protect your operating system from unauthorized activities and actions within your operating system. So the Marantis Container Runtime is the most secure and the most widely used container runtime uh, currently out there. Uh, we actually run in multiple uh, federal and government agencies, which, as you probably know, is pretty secure intensive, right? Security intensive. So armed with FIPS 140-2 validated encryption, uh, you have sensitive data that is encrypted. Uh, it protects your core operations, reduces your attack vectors because malicious actors cannot come in and intercept your uh, data in transit to see what's going on there to, to extract any sensitive information that can be, then be used for attacks and it saves you time for defining your own standard as well if you are looking to be FIPS 140-2 validated. We also have image signing out of the box that prevents unauthorized code from executing within your container environment. Um, there is actually Swarm orchestration out of the box as well. So for a lightweight orchestration, if you want to look at how to spin up multiple containers uh, within your environment, uh, you actually do have um, a CLI-based swarm orchestration that is available to you to start some of that uh, container orchestration activities. You also have out-of-the-box uh, supported CRI into Kubernetes, so you don't have to have an additional adapter in front of something like a, um, a container D uh, in order to hook this container runtime into your Kubernetes orchestration should you want to connect it to uh, your Kubernetes cluster, or if you're looking at setting up your new Kubernetes clusters. And this is fully supported, of course, on Windows. It is the, um, the specified runtime for many uh, vendors that require a container runtime on Windows and also on other operating systems, such as Red Hat, Ubuntu, and so on and so forth. 
So with the Linux Container Runtime, you get all of this out of the box. So you could then focus your effort on developing what's really valuable to you, which is your application code, and bring that value to your users with as little friction as possible. Now, if you're looking at doing something more powerful, Mirantis actually offers much more than just the container runtime on Windows. So you have the execution through Mirantis Container Runtime on your, uh, on your environments. Then through deployment, we have our orchestration through the Mirantis Kubernetes engine, uh, which is an enterprise-grade orchestrator that includes both Kubernetes and Docker Swarm. We have K0s, which is less resource intensive that runs on the edge. We have Lagoon, which actually allows you a low friction application delivery from your code, from your Git repository, all the way to your Kubernetes clusters without your developers or your, um, your um, uh, team from having to worry about the platform, the setting up, making sure that everything is defined properly. We have policy controls to make sure that everything is safe when you're deploying. And then you also have, uh, we also have Lens App IQ, which handles the deployment and visualization that gives powers to your developers and your DevOps SRE teams uh, to look into the clusters, look into what your application is doing, security, and also manage the uh, teams and clusters all in one uh, single environments through both Lens App IQ and the Lens Kubernetes IDE. And from the security side of things, we have not, well, everything has got security built in, but in terms of security scanning, making sure that things are locked down, making sure that only authorized users are able to sign code and deploy code, we have the Maranthus Secure Registry, which is your container registry that you can control through policies uh, that and can scan images for any vulnerabilities, provide remediation steps, uh, provide lifecycle management, such as pruning, mirroring, garbage collection, all that kind of good stuff. And all of that uh, comes into one uh, single platform that allows you to secure, visualize, deploy, and run your applications with ease. For those of you that actually like to try out the Mirantis Container Runtime on your Windows environment, um, please, do visit uh, marantis.com. You'll see at the top there are, is a section for free trials. And we look at the Marantis Container Runtime, you will see a page similar to this. Uh, if you enter in your information here, what we will do is we'll go through all of the, uh, the necessary procedures and processes to provide you with a trial uh, implementation of the Marantis Container Runtime. So you could actually test it out within your Windows environment if you have Windows containers that you need to run, uh, but are currently running on um, developer level, you know, or open source level container runtimes without kind of your scaling and enterprise hardening, right? So we like you to have a test drive of our Marantis container runtime on your environment. So you could see and compare and contrast the differences between what you're currently using versus the Marantis container runtime. So please do, uh, visit the website at marantis.com, go to free trials, and try out the Marantis Container Runtime. So with that, uh, appreciate the time uh, that you spent over here, and it's been a pleasure to present this information to you, and look forward to seeing all of you in an upcoming webinar. So thank you very much.